want to um, cause a little trouble with Peter Darby. That's what we're doing here today. And I do not understand why pg e is just plowing ahead, installing smart meters when lots and lots of cities and, and counties are opposing this. This is really an outrage what pg e is doing. The fact is that cities and counties have formal ordinances designed for wireless communication technology devices. They have formal or ordinances and pg e and the CPUC are completely disregarding the cities and counties ordinances and they are not going through the formal review and planning processes for this type of devices. It's an outrage. Fairfax, uh, I, I think they're the only one that have come out and put a definite mor moratorium uh, on smart meter installation in that town. Um, how did you feel when you heard that news? I felt, I felt wonderful that, that the local authority, local government is standing up to uh, the state and standing up to, to, to PG&E. Uh, you know, Fairfax uh, passed an ordinance last week that, that would uh, ban smart meters in the town based on that town's uh, 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 wireless antenna uh, ordinance already. So uh, Fairfax is the first, but we expect a number of communities throughout the state to join them. Uh, on Tuesday evening, Watsonville directed their city attorney to do everything in their power to prevent the installation of smart meters within the town of Watsonville. And um, this, is only go this brush fire is only going to grow as people learn about the health risks. I made the sign smart meters um, could make 120,000 people homeless, and I made that sign because of a very important statistic. In 1998, the Department, California Department of Health Services did a comprehensive survey and found that there were 120,000 people in California alone that were electromagnetically sensitive and could not work because of it. So you can be sure if they can't work and they're going to have three smart meters on their house, each one approximately a thousand times stronger than a cell phone, they certainly will not be able to live in their house, let alone work. So we're going to essentially be homeless. Some will be living tents, some will be leaving the country, and some will just be finding alternative, you know, temporary housing such as in Fairfax for a while until we see what happens there. Now, what types of health uh, problems can these smart meters cause, and have you heard of any uh, that they have caused uh, so far? Well, just at a time when we're learning more and more about the, the health risks of using cell phones. For example, uh, a recent 10-year uh, study, international study, found that there was a 40% increase in the risk of uh, glioma, brain tumors, uh, during, for people who have used cell phones heavily over the past 10 years. You know, does it really make sense to be rolling out that same technology to, to millions of homes throughout California and taking a risk uh, with, with our health. So, uh, you know, symptoms and diseases that have ha that have been linked to EMF radiation include cancer of various types, uh, sleeplessness, uh, DNA disruptions. There are peer-reviewed scientific literature uh, that the FCC, who are responsible for keeping us safe from these emissions in the U.S., simply are not paying attention to. If these smart meters were installed in a country like uh, Russia, for example, they would be illegal because that country considers uh, the emissions from, from these meters too high. We'd like to see the CPUC uh, put a moratorium, immediate moratorium on the smart meters, and uh, I'd like to see them banned. We're here to stop it, period. Who's Peter Darby? Peter Darby is the CEO of uh, PG&E, and he's hiding behind global warming and you know, th saying that the smart meter program is for global warming, it's going to help the environment. There were, there have been reams of documents when they presented this whole program to the CPUC. Global warming was never even mentioned. It was all automatic reading, AMR. They only care about profit and money. And we have informants from PG themselves who say that the components themselves cost about $15 to $20. We're all being charged between five and six hundred dollars per meter, in the form of a one and a half percent rate increase that CPUC gave PG&E, and then through the years, when we get further rate increases, it'll be over on top of that. So they'll just be reaping the money in, and so it's forced consumerism. We're being forced to buy something we don't want um, for a variety of reasons: incorrect billing, um, lack of privacy, and destroying our health. What is uh, the occasion here? What is Peter Darby going to? That He's going to be talking about how great smart meters are and how great they are for the environment and how it's going to save our environment. What do you want to tell us? That it's not going to. You know, that in fact, these smart meters use energy. You know, it uses energy to uh, buy the appliances that go into your house that will be connected to the smart meter, and then it takes energy to run it. And there's way, way more energy efficient ways to do this program. People are going to cut their electricity use, not the smart meter. Smart meter doesn't save energy.
I believe that there is merit uh, in pursuing uh, alternatives that have strategies that have a, uh, a different approach than renewables. And I think we will need renewables to get a quick start. Uh, but I think uh, strategies of looking at carbon intensity and reducing that are useful. And I think they will be promoted by a cap and trade bill. Uh, on the topic, one of the things I did fail to touch on about the renewable standards is that uh, recently we've done a fair amount of work. And first we did a binder on case studies of bringing renewables to market. And what we saw was in certain cases to get them uh, permitted and licenses established was, uh, and approved were seven to nine years. And that's too long. Uh, and so I recently requested another binder that's been presented to me, which looks at all of our different renewable projects and then looks at the path that they have to take to get approved and then where they are in that path and the status. And what it shows is that far and away the greatest obstacles that we have for bringing renewables to market are the different permitting and agency approvals, federal level, state level, and local level. And what we need, and the governor has taken a step in this direction, and I think we have to reinforce that step, is that each of the different agencies, like a Fish and Game, Coastal Commission, whatever, uh, is pursuing their principal and initial objective. And they haven't been sufficiently aligned around climate and energy policy for the state of California. And so one of the things we need to do is look at using the tools of modern process management and production to think of this as a production line and say, how can we send renewable contracts, renewable companies through this as quickly as possible so we can bring up these renewable projects? We've contracted for more than 24% renewable power, but last year or this past year, I think, you know, if we're lucky we're at 17 or 18 percent. And so what we need to do is work together with government. We've also realized that a lot of these agencies haven't been funded to look at all of these and review and approve these permits. So I think what we need is rather than more laws, you know, coming at us a thousand new laws a year, we have to look at how do we get government working as efficiently and effectively, using taxpayer dollars as effectively, so that we're, we're achieving the goals that legislators have set out. So that's a long answer to your question. Working on carbon intensity, yes, is a good idea. I think we need um, renewables to kickstart the process and move us forward. Cap and trade is the right approach to go. And we have to work on stream, streamlining the permitting process. Uh, I'll answer future questions more briefly. Uh, we have one about, um, this will be a real brief one for you. Will you, would you and or pg &E support, actively support, but actively underline, a carbon tax rather than a cap and trade as effective mechanism to control CO2 emissions? If you want to give a little more reason, you hit on it briefly as to why. We believe that a cap and trade uh, program is the right way to go, uh, and that um, it, it provides the most efficient and effective uh, approach to go. So we're going to continue to push on that. We recognize that an alternative that would be very simple, uh, difficult politically to get through is a carbon tax. That wouldn't be quite as effective and complete, but it would certainly be better than nothing. I would, you know, if we were going to do something like that, what would be great is rather than taxing people for working and earning an income, it would be nice to raise a tax, let's say, on carbon and in a similar uh, way reduce income tax so that it was tax neutral, but we were we were taxing something bad rather than taxing something that's good. Um, they just keep coming. Um, two related questions. Um, what are what are two top what are the top two to three reasons Congress could not put together um, a deal on climate and what are the um, what can you know companies like PG&E and some of your similarly minded companies do to help broker a deal. Um, and the flip side of that is why, and given that we tend to see a lot of Republican leadership being resistant to um, these energy solutions and cap and trade and stuff, how do, how do we get them all up to start um, working together to try and find a, a common ground that's broad enough that we all can probably agree upon? 
Um, and uh, as I answer this, I tend to focus on the first question and then uh, we'll forget the second one. So feel free to bring up, uh, uh, remind me. The first question was uh, what stood in the way or what prevented us? Uh, from yes, I sort of sort of what were the hurdles and then what are top, the, you know, the top two to three reasons that Congress couldn't put together a deal on climate? Okay, uh, in answer to the question, uh, one of the first hurdles was the coal lobby, as well as utilities and people concerned about rates, uh, were a big problem because the cost of coal tends to be the pure generation about three to four cents a kilowatt hour, and the cost of natural gas that we use here in California is about eight to nine cents a kilowatt hour. So the cost of coal is about half as much. Also, in coal states, coal mining is a, is a big issue. So the coal lobby was out there in a big way. The other thing is the utilities that operate in those areas said, we're really worried that if there's going to be an increase in rates, uh, there's going to be a lot of pushback. We may get lots of disallowances. Our shareholders will be hurt, and, and we don't want that. Uh, then I think uh, you know there's kind of the traditional oil and gas lobby uh, that doesn't want this uh, le legislation outside the utility industry. I think we were heading down the road. Uh, Senator Graham working with uh, uh, Senator Kerry and Lieberman. Here we had a Democrat, uh, uh, independent, and a uh, Republican working together. I'll tell you, Senator Graham exercised uh, great courage because the Republican Party wanted to kill him. Uh, and um, it gets really mean-spirited out there, I have to tell you. This guy really exercised a lot of leadership. He was going strong on that until Obama said, I'm going to do immigration instead of climate. And uh, that wasn't the deal, at least as everybody understood it. The climate was going to be right after financial institution regulation. Uh, and Graham said, you sort of doubled back on me, and you broke your promise, and I'm, I'm leaving. And so we lost the Republican support there. Then what happened was uh, the oil spill in the Gulf with BP, uh, and, and the direction people were heading in was a compromise deal where there would be more offshore drilling, uh, you know, maybe uh, more gas opportunities, natural gas, uh, and that would bring in enough Republican support to deal with kind of the traditional Democrat progressive issues. And the whole thing started to unwind at that point uh, because of uh, President Obama and the deal that promoted offshore drilling at that point was, was a no sale with the American people. Uh, the second part of it was... Uh, I, I, I'm going to say you hit on it with the Republican leadership being resistant. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the thing that I'm concerned about, I said to my wife one night coming back from the Carnegie Institution, I said, we're falling behind. And for people to really understand climate change, there's a tremendous momentum that's established. If, if we uh, stop the growth of CO2 right now, the Earth would continue to warm for eight or 10 years more, uh, just because of all the energy that's been pumped into the oceans, which I sail a lot and swim in a lot, snorkeling, looking at the damage to coral. Uh, and uh, my big concern here is by the time the consequences of climate change are apparent, brutally apparent to everyone, it's too late. We've passed the tipping point. Okay, I have a couple um, that are related here. Uh, trying to group them as possible. Um, someone picked up on your um, analogy to PG&E as pioneers, um, and and. I also want to expand that, not just the PG&E, but um, sort of the other question of, you know, you hear a lot of people saying, why does California always have to be first? You know, is, is it sometimes better to let someone else go first and be that pioneer and learn from those mistakes? Are we actually doing more harm than good to ourselves? Granted, we do a lot of good things, but as you alluded to, we do some other things not so well. <laughs> Well, I think the key message there is to think about risk management uh, in that regard. And so um, that was exactly what we had in mind as we started pioneering the work on um, climate change in 2006. I said to myself, you know, uh, many of us are veterans of the energy crisis and were hurt very badly by that, uh, and it impacted us greatly. So I said, what do we do to infuse risk management into our work on climate change? And you'll recall what happened during the energy crisis is there was kind of a great theory about how to deregulate the wholesale market. And what happened was prices didn't go down as people expected, and they went up, and they went up a hundredfold. And it created a crisis and it bankrupted our company and 
So let, let me give me life. Very unpleasant here at the commission and at, at pg and &E across our territory. So what we did there was we said, let's think about how we can de-risk uh, climate change. And so we said a cost collar, which would create rails on which uh, a low cost of a coal per ton and a high cost and limit, put it between there, and, and that was a technique for risk management. I think what happens in California sometimes is we all get going and we think everything's a great idea and everybody's sort of looking at the upside and the potential, but they're not thinking about, so what could go wrong and what are the measures that we should put in place to deal with what might go wrong? Okay. Um, another issue that you had was you stated, um, you kind of focused on the company and on the commission and on policymakers uh, regarding climate change and making a difference. Um, but what, what, in your opinion, and from the company's perspective, can consumers do to effectuate change and to assist the state and all these companies to, to make the goals? Because ultimately, it's consumers. Well, I think uh, you know the first thing that people can do is they can uh, work to understand their climate, uh, their, their uh, carbon footprint and to say, how can we reduce it? So, you know, if I look at it in our house, uh, you know, when our kids were growing up uh, and I'd walk into a room and say, every parent has done, and found all the lights on and the stereo on and the TV on and all of that, I instituted initially a 25 cent fine per, per incident. <laughs> and so, you know, it's amazing. And I'd say, go get your money. And, uh, you know, and put it right in here. And uh, that actually had an impact. Uh, but then if I look at other things, we've got to put it in the HVAC system, new system, got a federal tax credit and rebate <coughs> as well uh, from the state, uh, making sure double pane windows. I, I actually get out there, you'd be interested to know every fall, I get out there on a Saturday morning and I'm there looking at the insulation around doors and all and putting in new insulation and checking for leaks. Because I'm just, you know, concerned about energy efficiency and it grew out of my orientation of being frugal as a uh, you know person before I met with you know some business success so I think that developing a mindset about that you know all the things you can read on uh, about that's what people can do but I think most importantly is finding a way to educate others about climate change and the concern and um, so frankly what we're doing right now uh, as a result of my concern about falling behind on this issue I said to my wife one night, coming back from um, the Carnegie Institution, we do need to institute breakout strategies. So uh, a couple of those are um, the uh, religious groups. Uh, if you look across Christianity, Buddhism, and Islam, in each uh, religion, uh, stewardship, good stewardship of the earth is fundamental. And so we're now working with some religious groups to look at how we can convey videos discussing the challenge of climate change and send those out. And we're working with a, a local church and person who's a leader in that regard and spreading that out. The other thing is uh, we've reached out uh, to educational institutions and are working with them. Excuse me. to look at the question about how we can address uh, in, in public speaking uh, opportunities uh, students, because I think 20-year-olds have a lot different view on this than 50-year-olds as a in, in the main. And 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds are a lot more concerned in thinking about the future and the future of this planet uh, than many other people. And so we're trying to get the message to them and talk about it so we can you know, bring them around at this point. I have a couple here relating to uh, what I will call wind power being uh, sort of the favorite renewable energy source of the past several years. Um, given that it tends to be a little bit, uh, we'll call it inefficient, given its intermittency and the need to still have a lot of backup generation and massive build out of transmission and such. How do you balance the renewableness of the resource with some of the operational and infrastructure issues on a whole? Well, I think the, uh, the key where we go on the um, uh, on balancing that is we have a view of how much wind we can have in the um, uh, of the renewables, and uh, so we have invested in some wind. Wind has been pretty big in the past. But the problem is with wind, it's really available in San Francisco and in this region when you least need it. 
we need we need uh, you know power most when the wind stops and the great Pacific air conditioning system stops. Uh, and that's when solar is really helpful. And so we're pushing and working in the direction of adding a lot more solar because that tends to be concurrent, uh, maximum generation with when we need it the most. And so we're shifting in that regard. But you're absolutely right that wind does need uh, backup, and so it's more expensive. Historically, it's been on the cheaper side in, in terms of um, you know the renewable alternatives. But I think you need to factor in the, the backstop gas turbine peaking capability uh, to combine with that. Wind is pretty erratic. I think um, you know there's a lot of wind at night, but frankly, when I look at the charts, uh, wind is erratic. Uh, and I think it will work with <laughs> cars. You know, and charging at night that'll be helpful. But uh, we can only have so much wind in our portfolio, and I think it's very important that we think about the backup cost associated uh, with the intermittency of wind. Um, okay, we're going to get into the bulk of the question. Um, we're going to start with, why is the public reaction to PG&E smart meters so much more negative than AMI being installed by other investor owned utilities? Um, that's a good question. Uh, first, as I said before, I don't think we've done as good a job of, of um, explaining and communicating to the public the benefits of smart meter um, to, to begin with. Secondly, uh, what I would say is we had a real problem in Bakersfield. Uh, and what happened in Bakersfield is uh, July a year ago, there were um, 17 days out of July over 100 degrees. And that contrasts with the previous July of six days uh, over 100 degrees. So a dramatic increase in the heat uh, during the month. Now, many of you aren't familiar, although I'm here at the commission, but many people aren't familiar with the tiered rate structure uh, of uh, rates for PG&E. Uh, tiers one and two are uh, you know, down in the 10 cent and 12 cent range, but tier three, in, in terms of this ties into the volume of usage and the demand, tier three is 30 cents, tier four 40 cents, tier five 50 cents a kilowatt hour. So what happened in the modeling that we did is you could have a $200 bill, uh, let's say the previous July or in June, and without any meter considerations or anything like that, just because you're drawing a lot more hot uh, air conditioning load in an immensely hot July, a $200 bill could run into $800 in that ship. And I don't think people really understood the tier system and how, or did they go back and look at how hot was it a year ago compared to it, but we simulated the results. And I think most of us, if you were used to your bill being $200, and it came in at $800, you would say, something's wrong here. And so I think the tier system of rates really impacted on that. Uh, just for the benefit of those that may not know, during the energy crisis, because of kind of the legislative deal that was put in place at that time, tiers one and two in the rate system were frozen. And that meant that every rate increase that came across during the subsequent years were pushed into tiers three, four, and five. And so what happened during that period is tier five went from maybe like 30 cents a kilowatt hour to 50 cents a kilowatt hour. So that means people in tier five are paying three times as much for power, for an increment, increment of power, as the average rates in California. And it was sort of an unintended consequence. Now what we've done is we've gotten together with Term and DRA, and we put something in front of the commission, which I believe has been satisfactorily received, to eliminate tier five, and, and so there's no more 50 cents a kilowatt hour. We're recommending to the commission the merging of tiers three and four to come down off of that 40 cent tier, but I think the rate structure was the primary uh, driver be behind that situation that occurred. Uh, and what happened was uh, a senator, state senator, got very activated about this situation. The people were very activated, and what happened was that uh, we had put in smart meters there, but we'd actually put them in a year previous. So they'd been around and operating just fine. So what happened there was uh, there was a lot of uh, kind of uh, 
for whatever set of reasons, uh, drumming up problems, rather than showing the kind of leadership that uh, a CEO would show if he's doing his job well, or a president of the commission, which is, I hear these concerns about smart meter being the cause of this problem, let's do a study, let's look into this, let's get the facts, and then let's make uh, the right choices. Um, based on you know so, sort of the subject of the talk, um, one half of it is remaining competitive in a rapidly changing environment. One of the ways, and this is kind of tails on the question you just or the answer you just gave. How do you see PG&E as well as probably the regulators um, adapting to the rapidly changing environment of the interaction with the consumer? We're asking them via all of these different mechanisms to be uh, much uh, better consumer as far as the resource, uh, know when to consume, that when not to consume, and be basically an active participant in the operation of the energy environment, whereas in the past, we haven't had to do that. It's getting that message. Well, I think uh, we're rolling out a set of advertisements now on television about um, smart meter and what it can do. Uh, but I think uh, one of the things that we need to do, and I'd encourage you all to do, is we need to recognize that customers want answers more quickly. And so well, where we failed on the particular problem there was uh, we should have more quickly got to the facts. The, the facts are, or the situation was, when these complaints first came in, we didn't know what the facts were. And I think had we to do it over again, what we would have immediately done is put in some electronic meters, the new smart meters, side by side with the uh, the traditional meters, and demonstrated not once but 50 times across and with complete visibility in that they were operating very effectively. <coughs> We've done an independent assessment of this and brought in also an independent uh, uh, firm, just as the uh, CPUC is doing. And what it has shown is that more than 99% of the meters are working correctly. So what our studies show is two tenths of one percent of the meters are not working correctly, uh, which is a very very small percentage for new technology. Anybody who's worked with PCs, both the cell phones and all that, a two percent failure rate, two tenths of one percent, excuse me, is very very attractive. Six tenths of one percent are because of errors on installation, and what I would say is while we're working for perfection, six tenths of one percent. Uh, working with contractors and employees in a home, I wish I could get contractors to work that well for me, and I don't know anybody who finds that their experience with contractors is better than 99% uh, good. So what happened here was we didn't react uh, quickly enough, provide people with the information quickly enough and be responsive to them. So from our standpoint, we have to anticipate better what's happening, and we have to give people answers more rapidly and I think the, the same is true of the Commission. You've heard some disappointment about uh, the structure analysis and how long it's going to take to get back to them. So in short, to summarize, I think you have to educate people up front. And when questions are raised, we have to do a better job of answering their questions responsibly. And we've got to do it much more quickly. And I think what goes for PG&E probably goes for the Commission in that regard. OK. Um, we have a number of questions that um, as far as communicating with consumers as well as installation of smart meters, touching on the concerns we heard a little bit about today, um, EMFs, some of the potential um, health impacts and things like that. Um, what is the company's strategy for looking at that and more globally, what do you think the industry in general should do given some of the news coming out of Hawaii, some of the, the reasons coming out of Maryland for them deciding to currently deny uh, a smart grid project and things of that nature. So, you know, I think it's always important to be open-minded uh, and look at the facts and the data. So um, let, me, let me just approach this question about RF radio frequencies uh, in a um, two-part question, or two-part response. Uh, the first was, it's been suggested here in California uh, that what ought to be done is that, and this is by um, a, a, a um, assembly person, that, that what we ought to do is really put the question of <coughs> uh, 
impact on people uh, to the uh, California Council on Science and Technology and to have them kind of take a look at this question uh, for the commission, uh, for consumers. And in, in an article that came out uh, yesterday or today, um, the, in what is called the Intelligent Utility publication, it, it said, uh, why would a study done by CCST trump anything already that's been done by the FCC, the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements, and the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, not to mention the U.S. Envi Environmental Protection Agency, the Food and Drug Administration, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, all whom have provided their support for the FCC on radio emissions. So, in other words, a lot of expert people have, have looked at this issue. But I, I took a different approach in trying to look at the facts and the data on this. You know, my background, I started at at and I was on the office of the chairman's staff when we were rolling out uh, advanced mobile phone services, it was called at at and that cell phone, in the early 80s. And then uh, I took, I was involved in taking, uh, for 10 years, cell phone companies public, and mergers and acquisitions, and then was the CFO of Pac Bell. So I know a little bit about telecommunications. And um, so I asked our people a couple of questions about, uh, smart meters and their emissions. You know, I sat there and I said to myself, now, when you use a cell phone, you put it right up next to your head. And some people really spend a lot of time on the phone. But the FCC has concluded that it's safe. And they've looked at this question of emissions. And there's been a lot of time and effort spent on that. I said to myself, uh, and actually to our team, I said, a smart meter isn't right next to your head. It's probably 20 feet away on the outside of the house, and there are probably two or three walls between you and the smart meter. Then I said to our guys, I asked the question, I said, so how much, how, uh, in day, what portion of the day is a smart meter actually transmitting? And they said, 45 seconds. 45 seconds a day. And so I said, what I, I want you guys to do is work with me on computing the uh, emissions that are received by a human being with a smart meter and compare that with a cell phone and help us understand that analysis. So they said, OK. So we said, let's be conservative. Let's assume that uh, the smart meter is only 10 feet away and rather than 10 or 20. Let's assume further that there are no walls between you and the smart meter, which we know, of course, there are. And let's assume the cell phone, that a person is only on a cell phone 10 minutes a day. Pretty good if you guys are on. So I said, tell me how the two compare. And what they said was the admittances received from the cell phone are 13,000 times more than from the smart meter. So in other words, if, if you have a home with a smart meter, you have to live in that home for 13,000 years before it compares with your use of a cell phone for one year. So the point I was making is the first thing we need to do is we need to have good facts, good statistics, and analytics, and dive into these issues. And then we have to find a way to package the answers in, in a way that people will receive the information and that they will, uh, that they will take it, look at it with an open mind, and understand it. Can you please, um, I just want to say hi to Lee Birdie. I have a question just about what you're talking about. And I was wondering if you could read my question about how PG is hiding the emissions data by time averaging. Can you read my question? I have a lot of questions there. I haven't heard about eight, and I haven't heard one of them being asked yet. Thank you. Okay, so, so I think the short message is, um, we need to get 
get to the facts very quickly. We need to develop the analysis. We have to put together you know, coherent, understandable story, which I hope I can still do all. And then we need to get that out of the channels. But what has happened in today's world, we have a polarized world today where everybody's going sort of out to the extremes. And, you know, as Leo Tolstoy uh, said, is, is that you can teach the, the simplest man the most complex of subjects if his mind is open, but you cannot teach the simplest of concepts uh, to a person if their mind is closed. And what we find in our day today is a lot of things sort of people develop a point of view on it, and then they're really not open, opening to, open to listening and thinking about the, the questions. And so I just encourage people to do that, and we have to do our best to recognize the reality of the world we live in and respond appropriately in that environment. We'll explain the time averaging then very simply. Okay, he's, he's going in, I'm not sure I understand the question, so Matt is going to take a look at that. Yeah. We got it right here. So, uh, why are you hiding actual real-time RF exposure by averaging your emission? Uh, why are you only looking at output from one meter? And there's a couple of questions re regarding, you know, one meter, two meter, twenty-four meters. You know, some of us are in San Francisco where you have a bank of meters. Um, is there um, a multiplying effect essentially? Um, and then taking into account the mesh network that things are bouncing around, um, is there is your analysis looking at the sort of the multiplying effect or the cumulative total? Right. As opposed to just the one. Okay. So the the answer to the question is the description that I just gave did not look at the complexifying issue of multiple uh, overlays. The the uh, review of this technology in the creation of it by these vendors uh, did look at that issue. They had to get licensed with the FCC. And uh, I, I don't have the specific answer to the, you know, the overlays of all of these, but what uh, we can do is we can work together with you in trying to respond to those questions. Um, it's a very uh, complicated set of uh, analyses, but that is the job of the FCC to do when they license people and their technologies in the meter um, vendors when they put it together. We've asked you this question since way last winter, and we okay. haven't had a response yet. I'll do my best to work with you to try to be responsive to that, <laughs> to get the company to be responsive. Okay. And can you give us a, a time, a date? Because <laughs> we've been waiting. And we have our own independent test. Okay. It's very easy to measure. I tell you what, I'd be happy to meet with you individually you. to understand that uh, and then to work to try and get answers to the questions. So if you provide your card or your information uh, to one of my staff, Renee Parnell, who's right there, we'll see what we can do to work through those issues. Thank you. Um, along those same lines, um, there's a lot of questions of regarding uh, communications with consumers or informing consumers about folks that have pacemakers and certain other health issues, um, I find some others. Um, has pg e started looking at sort of the communication materials and starting to work with those folks, um, as well as some of the medical groups, to work together to try and figure out how to communicate that, how to work together, and things like that? Uh, we're looking at the overall communication on this, and so what we're, I've asked our people to do, I think that we're probably addressing pretty substantially and adequately the question of, are these meters accurate? And the CPUC will come out with the result of their study. We'll all look at the results, but I think, uh, based on what we've seen thus far, uh, these, these meters that we are introducing are significantly more accurate than the ones that are there. Uh, with respect, what I've asked people to do is look at the whole question of RF, identify the different issues that can be raised, and to undertake our best efforts to respond to what are the questions, and then to evaluate how can we, what channels should we use to get that information out. Okay, so that, uh, that's what we're doing to try and be responsive. We believe that by anticipating these questions, which I admit we haven't done as well as we should have, uh, un analyzing them, understanding them, responding to them, and getting out to people as quickly as possible is the best way to stay ahead of us. If we don't, then what happens 
is there gets to be you know kind of a snowball coming at us, and at that point people don't have their ears open to listen to the answers, and therefore it's more difficult to have a dialogue. So that that's what our intent is. That's what we'd like to, to work through. Um, there's a number of questions, we're going to switch topics quickly, um, that want to ask regarding Prop 16. Um, obviously that was a pretty controversial topic around the state, um, and it actually bled outside of the state. Um, so we'll start with the general one. Um, so what was the reason, what was the rationale um, for going down that path? You know, I, I, I've thought a lot about this question, and uh, what I've concluded is that if I start to, to answer the question, it might appear like we're relitigating the issue, and we don't want to do it. So I think a satisfactory way to answer the question is that we have heard the voters on this issue. We accept the decision of the voters. And the message we take away from that is we have to redouble our efforts to provide outstanding customer service. And we are focused on doing exactly that. Do you think there would have been a different outcome um, had you not, let me make sure I get this right, had you not included community choice aggregation, but rather left it simply as an anti-eminent domain measure? I, I'm not sure. We didn't. We haven't pulled that one, and I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Um, and then, um, what uh, what was PG&E's financial interest uh, in funding and passing, hopefully, passing Prop 16? Um, both sides of the financial interest, not just PG&E's own. I would say. Okay, um, and I'm going to try and um, answer this question in a way that doesn't kind of relitigate the, the territory. So uh, let me uh, let me explain some of the uh, the thought processes there. Uh, many of you are aware that we had uh, a takeover effort uh, with respect to Sacramento, uh, and uh, we spent. And I may be a little wrong on these numbers, but you know, order of magnitude, I think that'd be right. I think we spent somewhere between 12 and 15 million dollars combating uh, the, uh, the takeover attempt at SMUD. Uh, we were successful there. My recollection is on that. I think we won, it's kind of 52-48. Uh, then uh, you may recall that uh, San Francisco tried to take over our um, properties uh, with them in the domain, and we spent another very substantial amount of money, I think on the same order, uh, there. Uh, we have in San Joaquin. Now, what's really important here is that in both those instances, government officials thought it was a great idea to take over, you know, and run the power business. But when they put it to a vote of the people, the people didn't agree. And in the end, the people uh, voted pretty strongly in favor of uh, PG&E. In fact, it was even more strong uh, in, um, uh, in San Francisco, more lopsided uh, in favor of the company. So what we thought was that um, we have a phenomenon occurring where city you know, and, and municipal uh, officials want to take over our business, but the people aren't behind that. They don't want to vote for it. And so the thought was if we mandated that uh, the people had to vote for that and we use the same two-thirds majority that is required, if uh, a utility wants to, a municipality wants to take over our operations, it requires two-thirds. And so we said, you know, we'll probably get less of this activity of a government official saying we want to take over in instances where the people don't want support that. Uh, we'll probably get less. And so we said $15 million a year on the one hand or $45 million once on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, that math works. And so uh, we concluded uh, one time $45 million. Uh, versus you know 15 million every year, uh, that financially uh, it made sense to try and eliminate the 15 million every year. Also, what happened was the 15 million every year was included in what is called operating income, 
so it reduces the valuation of the company, reduces the earnings, whereas the $45 million was viewed as a one-time item, and analysts today kind of ignore one-time items. Uh, and so that didn't hurt the share price at all, whereas the $15 million would hurt the share price by the amount of our uh, uh, price earnings ratio. Um, switching, again, switching topics a little bit, um, to what extent, and this might be a, a quick one for you, to what extent is PG&E support of political efforts or others to end the nuclear moratorium in California? You touched on it a little bit beforehand, but not... Yeah, the, uh, the, the position that PG&E has taken pretty ardently is that we're neutral vis-a-vis -vis the uh, moratorium in California. Uh, and what we've observed, frankly, politically, was if we were to really jump in to that fray, people would come at us uh, you know, from all corners. What we see in our polling is people support the relicensing of Diablo. Uh, and what we felt was most important is to get Diablo relicensed. Uh, and uh, if we were to jump into the fray of you know, starting up nuclear and all of that, people would come at us and probably there'd be stronger opposition to oppose the relicensing of Diablo. You know, from my own standpoint, the, the uh, constituency, the customers of California are very heterogeneous and they have very strong views. And so I've sort of said to myself, do we really want to jump in and try and build a nuclear power plant? And you know, my reaction is not not sort of in my lifetime. Come on, you know. And, and uh, you know, the state has said they want energy efficiency and they want renewables, uh, and that's where we're putting the emphasis. You know, we're trying to listen to what the state and customers are saying, and that's what they're saying. So we're trying to step up and do that. Um, with respect to smart grid and some of the advanced meters, there's there's a new question that has sort of come to the forefront about the security of the grid about security of information, security of data. Uh, it's a new system that now could be hacked, like we see hackers and other things. Um, so what, what is the company, as well as you know, some of the regulators, should be, should be aware of or, or looking into as we move forward with this advanced transmission, advanced network of systems that we haven't had before? In other industries, yes, but in the energy sector, no. And how do we provide um, assurances that it's double and triple Secure. So I think, uh, you know, um, this form of terrorism uh, is a real concern and a concern that the FERC has, and it's very much, uh, it's high in there, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's list. Uh, and we are working it. We've actually hired somebody uh, that's very involved in the effort that came from the Fed, because you can imagine that there's tremendous uh, desire to, to hack into banking uh, transactions, and there have been for years. And so the financial institutions arena is, is kind of a really good area. Um, I, I want to think about uh, how carefully I should answer this question, uh, but um, we have gone over with our folks uh, the security uh, around smart meters and the like, uh, and I was really impressed. Uh, by how far our folks have come over the last few years. There are different ways to get into the grid, and people have appropriately indicated that you know anything you hang on the grid is an area of opportunity for terrorists. Uh, and uh, uh, because of, I think, our own orientation first, but because of the FERC, they are doing audits of this issue, uh, and our in companies are self-reporting on what their incidences are. But we actually can look in and determine at any point in real time the, the threat level and the level of activity of this nature. And we can zoom right in on homes and utility poles uh, real time and see what's going on. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and we can tell what the threat level is by address. Uh, so uh, what I would say is that um, there's a fear amount there. You can never sit on your laurels and be complacent. Uh, but what I will say is our company is probably uh, near the leading edge of that issue. We benefit from the technology orientation being close to Silicon Valley. And it's an area that we and the entire country have to be ever vigilant on. And the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, through the NERC, uh, which is a kind of subsidiary of it under its, and, and, and focused on enforcement, 
is going, doing audits of companies in this regard, uh, finding companies for, uh, for compliance, and working very hard uh, to uh, deal with this terrorist threat. Yeah, we're just about out of time, so I just want to close with one um, one observation and then maybe get your reaction to it. Um, it it's kind of clear that from the, the questions and also some of the press that uh, pg e has kind of taken some lumps over the past several months. Um, and some of my questions kind of got to the bottom of it as well as some of these folks' questions about what is the company's goal to repair its image, repair its relationship with its consumer. It's got a lot of work to do and, and how do you plan on getting there and how do you plan on and also, given that you know, we mentioned you know, 15, 20 million customers, um, that's a lot of different territory, a lot of customers that need a lot of different things, as you mentioned. And it's a very interesting balancing act um, as the head of the company. How do you plan on leading, leading the march? Yeah. Uh, that, that's a very good question, and one that we're spending a lot of time talking about, and our board is talking with us about. Um, you know, um, at the end of the energy crisis, at the time we emerged from bankruptcy, pg es approval rating was 20%, uh, and about the same level as our legislature has been. Uh, the, uh, over time, prior to, let's say, a year ago, we had worked at the high point had been 65% approval. Uh, and so we had made uh, tremendous progress in that regard. I mean, outstanding progress, actually, when you think about it. And uh, the strategy there has been, um, from the first day certainly that I took over, we said we don't want to use the term ratepayer anymore. And the reason was a, a ratepayer connotes someone who is a prisoner of a regulated monopoly. Yep. I said we want to use the term customer because a customer is someone you have to go out and win their loyalty each and every day. And so a group of 15 of us at that time set out a new vision for pg e to be a leader in the industry. Uh, we set out goals that would establish how we would be there, and that was we would know we were a leader when our customers said so, when our employees said so, when our shareholders were saying they're treating us like a leader, and then people said we were environmental leader. And that strategy has served us uh, very well uh, and moved us from 20 up to 65% uh, you know, at the high uh, there. Uh, we took uh, Knox, uh, around Prop 16. Uh, we knew we would take that, so we probably took more than we should. What happened during that time is some people said, we see Prop 16 going, why don't we see if we can create a lot of problem in, you know, around and, and work on the company in addition to, to, because this fall in popularity will help us combat the company on Prop 16. Uh, that was a pretty successful strategy. So I think uh, what we are uh, doing now is we're saying the strategy was good, so we're going to stick with the basic strategy of those five points, but we need to augment the strategy. First thing was one of the key changes in 2005 is I got out and met with the press. I met with David Lazarus, our greatest antagonist. And, and uh, you know, he came around, actually. He, he came around. Uh, and uh, so what happened was uh, we were out there with the press, and in the midst of Prop 16 and everything, we pulled back a little bit from the press, and we want to be out there. Uh, another thing that President Peavy suggested to us was uh, creating forums in different regions where we were out in listening forums, where we would go out, talk with people, and create forums where uh, you know customers are telling us what they like and what they don't like, so we could leverage off that. I thought President Peavy's suggestion there was excellent. We've already gone and implemented it, like many of his suggestions. I kind of say, you know, let's follow. And, and so uh, we, uh, we went out and we met with uh, uh, people. Chris Johnson's been undertaking a tour where he's out meeting with customers, hearing their feedback. So we're doing that. Uh, what we've concluded is we're probably light on marketing. And in fact, you know, historically, um, you know, the commission hasn't thought that that was a valuable, you know, they haven't supported dollars for marketing in a big way, uh, if at all. And I think, you know, it's in the interests of uh, the commission and ourselves that uh, we think about, so where are our customers, where are the different segments of customers, what are their issues and how to be responsive to that. And the last thing is, 
people have said that pg e has become a less local company over time as we've tried to centralize and make more efficient our operations. And we're working to try and make sure that we're, we have a local presence in different regions and we understand what's of interest in those different regions to people and we're responsive to those needs. So that's the basic strategy and we're working on it each and every day to make it even better.